Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by the Western Costume Company. Our guest today is a British Academy Award winning costume designer for film and television. In 2001, she won the Academy Award for Best Costume Design for the 2000 film Gladiator. She's also received nominations for BAFTA Awards, Saturn Awards, Satellite Awards. She's been a frequent collaborator of English director Ridley Scott. She's worked in the fashion industry prior to her career in film and television. Her first credited role as costume designer was for the 1993 British comedy Bad Behavior. And she worked on a further six films in that role for the rest of the decade. In 2000, her work on Ridley Scott's Gladiator earned her first career awards, including the Academy Award for Best Costume Design. And she is a frequent collaborator with Ridley Scott, having worked on films such as Hannibal, which, by the way, does not get enough love, Kingdom of Heaven, American Gangster, Body of Lies, Robin Hood, and she received a Saturn Award nomination and her fourth Satellite Award nomination for Prometheus and Exodus, Gods and Kings, The Martian, which is one of the greatest science fiction films of the last 20 years, and her most recent films in two, two months, The Last Duel, and House of Gucci, which, by the way, has never made me want to go out and buy clothes more than that film in my entire life. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome the iconic Academy Award-winning costume designer, Janty Yates, to the Designing Hollywood Show. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My God, uh, I'm a huge fan. And as, as, I was, as I was looking into your career, I was just asking you, you worked on Quest for Fire. I mean, wardrobe back in back in uh, the '80s. What what was that like? <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to say hello and thank you very much for having me. It's delightful to be here to talk about moi. No, thank you very much. Um, going back, that was in 1979. Um, we were very unioned up in uh, Britain and. I remember having to skip behind all the huts we were working in because they wouldn't let us work in the buildings because we were working on real hide. I hate to say this, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, we had to skip avoiding the, um, the, uh, the, the men who came with, um, with the unions to check everybody over. And so I was actually just written down as um, local labor. Um, I think probably in, you know, Kenyan local labor. But I did the whole film and uh, I started in early prep. Then the film went to the wall. Everybody was um, off it apart from uh, myself, who was asked back because nobody knew how the costumes went on with the new designer, John Hale and his uh, his team from Canada uh, and so it was it was wonderful because I had no responsibility um, and yet <laughs> I went all the way through the film we shot in Kenya in Savo Park for the best part of two or three weeks and it was it was brilliant wonderful experience but I wouldn't imagine Jean-Jacques Anno knew me from a bar of soap, frankly. But he did. You did come back and work together on on Enemy at the Gates, which uh, another film that wasn't exactly couldn't have been easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was very fortunate because I had the best um, military expert by my side, who happened to be a friend anyway, David Crossman. He's gone on, he started on uh, <clears throat> with Spielberg on um, um, one of his military films and he went through to, he's done every military film you can think of and he's doing this film with me now. So he really is the best. And so I was able to do a lot of Teflon shouldering onto poor David's responsible shoulders. Well, I, I have to ask, I mean, obviously you, you worked a lot with Ridley Scott. And I, I think I once read, maybe it was even an interview with you, or something to the effect of, of in Ridley Scott's films, the clothes have to feel and look real and lush. 
And I mean, obviously, his attention to detail is is legendary. But does that make your job as a costume designer more difficult? It pushes you to the envelope. You know, basically, you really are always on a knife edge. And you're only as good as the film you're doing. So although he's asked me back, there's nothing to say he'll ask me back again. And that, in a way, is a very good thing because it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you on the hop. And basically, you are just striving for the best possible that you can ever achieve. And I've been fortunate. I've been asked back. But I do work for other directors as well. Yeah, you've worked for Michael Winterbottom, um, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, But I guess before, you know, everyone wants to know the journey people take into this industry. And on this show, everybody's sort of had a different way of getting into costume design. Sort of take us back, how were you drawn to it from an early age? Did you fall into it? How did you find yourself in costume design? Well, I started making clothes literally when I was 10 or 11. And um, I got to the point when I was 13 of not even using patterns. So I'd make the same hipster bell bottoms that you know, just different color different pattern every week but um i drew every single day i just have books and books full of really maybe sort of stick insect models in varying guises of clothing um and i just made my clothes i mean i i have one job where i had to travel around the country and my sewing machine was my best friend. That was when I was 21. So I just, I just, it was just part of my life. It was nature. And so I then went to, it was obvious that I was going to pattern cutting, dress making, dress design college. I went there and basically I realized that I think you have to be mega rich to become a fashion design not costume design and we had no rich friends my mother was living on a widow's might um all you have to do like a galliano sleep under your cutting table produce eight exquisite outfits and you know be bought up by vogue or whoever um and i realized that actually you i i didn't have the extreme design of a galliano or a mcqueen um which was kind of just as well. And I went into wholesale fashion. Um, Hmm. That was the most soul destroying job I ever had. (laughs) It's like altering a collar once a year sort of thing. But I did stick that for a bit. Um, I was just a fashion sketcher. And uh, so I was always in that line. Really, I, I didn't, I didn't steer off it at all and then my boyfriend of the time said that you know i should just approach this neck of the woods and i knew nobody in it i became an assistant's assistant assistant to somebody who i knew was doing commercials worked for free absolutely you know worked for free for about six months um my boyfriend was an editor and uh, he very sweetly said he keep me that sounds very grand but not quite like <laughs> not like madame bovary but you know i was my i was fed and watered i basically managed to start getting a bit of a salary and it just literally went from there and i think one of the first things i did in 79 was um quest for fire so uh, i mean London and it was open when you've done a feature I will, it's just, it's, you know, it wouldn't be the first film that I would have thought any costume designer would jump into. I mean, it's, it certainly was, was, was not unique, especially when you hear from other people from the British film industry, Quest for Fire would not be the first, you know, I would think some Elizabethan period piece or something you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd cut your teeth on. But now were you, were you a fan of, of movies growing up? Well, not a boffin in any way shape or form my mother and i would go to um the cinema every week um 
we adored Lawrence of Arabia, we adored Anna Karenina, you know, the big, lush, beautiful films of the 70s. And um, basically, we'd, we'd see most things that were out, but we weren't, you know, looking for black and white Japanese. <laughs> I was unaware of Kurosawa. Well, you know, the, the the at the time in London, like you said, making your the bell bottoms and and uh, the the fashion of the time, were you also in, inspired by what was going on culturally in terms of of what you were drawn to in terms of clothes and things like that, or did you have influences in the music industry? Were you fans of bands and the way they dressed? Oh well, I mean, we all dressed like that. It was just it was par for the course, you know, from the age of. 13, I was wearing mini skirts, hipster mini skirts, hipster flowery bell bottoms, you know, grandpa t shirts, because I am a child of the 70s, really. And it was the most extraordinary. Now I realize, you know, with millennials growing up today, how absolutely extraordinary the period I grew up in was how radical the 60s were completely different from the 70s the late 70s were completely different from the mid 80s the mid 80s were completely different from the 90s and the mid 90s totally different again i mean a bit like the um, napoleonic era where everything completely changed which guess what i'm doing at the moment well i was going to say are you working on kit bag yes i i I'm I'm very excited. <laughs> you know, I I'm a big Stanley Kubrick fan and he wanted to make his ultimate Napoleon movie and there's that Toshin book that has all the research that he'd done from the period and um he never got to do it. So, yeah. I've always been a fan of the Napoleonic era, so I I can't wait. And Ridley Scott doing it? Come on. So, I'm you know, I'm curious when you started you we worked in British television. Um what was that like for you? Oh, well, listen, I mean, I was just happy to work. I was just happy to get the work. And it was, I would imagine my bread and butter was commercials for ages. And then just to get a small, my first um, sort of design credit was a half hour film for the BBC. And, uh, you know, it was just so exciting. And then I just seemed to fall into doing various television series and i was delighted and thrilled to do that knackered but um <laughs> you know because you work so hard i mean you're shooting two or three units at the same time different scripts different directors different whatever but it's a real burning by fire and let me tell you commercials is not straightforward they're always little mini feature films in fact more intense and terrifying you know you've got to have this sky blue pink suit and you've got it oh it's friday well we're shooting on monday you know now did you ever work with mr scott on any commercials i mean obviously he, not at all no no never did funnily enough because i worked for most of the um the british glitterati of uh, of uh, let's say commercials to film you know the uh, the chaps who moved on. But um, I also worked for, I just worked for lots of different directors and got asked back. So it was silly not to really, because it was good money and it was very good work. Well, you worked on a, on, on what I've always thought was a pretty cool movie, uh, Plunkett McLean. And it was directed by Jake Scott, Ridley's son. But, and you worked for Jake before you worked for Ridley. How did you find yourself working on that film? That's a very cool, very cool movie. Well, thank you for that. It was really castigated because Jake was Ridley's son and they just could not accept him. I think it's a very talented movie. I do too. That it had pop music, did not go down with the critics at all well. And yet the extraordinary, um, Oh, I will rock you. What was it called? The um, the movie that followed. A, a Knight's Tale. Yeah, I knew you'd know it. Yeah. <laughs> we 
with I Will Rock You. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that went down absolutely like a storm. It was huge and wonderful rock and roll music to these funky guys. And really, we were exactly the same. We were just ahead of our time. And then it was adapted later. You know, stuff like Baz Luhrmann using pop music and period pieces. So you were ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. We were. Well, I take no credit for that. That's entirely Jake. But he'd come in and say, oh, my dad's been looking at rushes over the weekend. I go, or to myself, I go, no, not really. <laughs> not so weekly, you know. <laughs> I like, had worshipped for years and years and years. And uh, it turned out that he actually had been looking at the rushes at the weekends. And uh, he eventually, um, I got a call to fly over. I was doing a film for Michael Winterbottom in uh, Belfast and uh, I got a call to go and meet Sir Ridley Scott in Shepparton well it turned out he took me, he took the makeup from Plunkett and McLean, he took the Steadicam operator, he took he did a bit of a milk actually you know and it, I went to meet him I never thought anything would come of it um, but it turned out it was Gladiator so I mean, it's incredible. You you work with with Jake Scott, then you work with Michael Winterbottom, who's known for he's done some such so so many innovative things in the independent film world, really. And then you're jumping into a monstrously huge studio picture that famously didn't even have a full script when they started shooting. I mean, it was or, or when we finished. <laughs> I mean it, and you're working with. I mean, Oliver Reed and Richard Harris. And then, of course, uh, you know, Connie Nielsen and Joaquin. The cast of that movie, yeah, uh, uh, Jaiman Hansu. Yeah, but suddenly, I mean, Oliver Reed, uh, one of my favorite actors. Yeah. <laughs> rest oh, rest in God. peace, sir. Oh, um, but so when you, when you jumped on to, obviously you knew who Ridley Scott was. You just said how, were you intimidated at all? Like suddenly you're. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Why me? Why me? I was, I was, you know, I was a girl. <laughs> Why me? Why not a bloke with battle experience and armor experience? But you know what? It was the most extraordinary, extraordinary time of my life. I was terrified, petrified every day of prep, every day of shooting, and but it was the most extraordinary experience and I was very lucky to have um, a very experienced supervisor who would point me in the right direction I was there creatively um, but she had done these big films before and you know thank goodness she was there really and also I think we had a blip and prep was pushed a month or two we had <laughs> a lot more prep than you normally would get on a film anyway you know a film of that size we were dressing 3,000 extras you know for the Colosseum we dressed them for a month we were going in at 2 2.30 um, and we'd get them all done by 10.30 which is 8 hours I don't do that anymore I mean the sheer diversity though of the costumes in that film I mean it opens with the Battle of Germania, where you have Roman legions in all of that resplendent armor and and then fighting basically a little bit more than Quest for Fire <laughs> barbarians from Germania. <laughs> they were all in skins, it's true. I mean, they were ancient, those skins, I have to add. Um, but yes, they were just in strips of leather and bits of fur. Um, it was uh, freezing cold as well. But yeah, I mean, it, I just... I just we just went ahead and did it <laughs> very frightening and i had about i think four or five different companies special effects costumers who are making the uh, armor different sections for different um different armorers you know and they'd bring on huge amounts of staff and churn it out um and it was really all in the paint effects that you know it looked like armor but it was very it was car bumper plus pva sure you know so light on a, on a film like that you know how how 
important is research or could you because I've always felt gladiator part of the appeal of it it, it does have a, a stylization in the costumes from or or were you going for period accuracy and was or is it a combination of the two um I've always said to anybody that asked you research the granny out of every film and then you can go a little bit diverse um, for example, all the extras in Rome, Ridley had said we were complete Alma Tadema fans. Um, and he said, I'd like to do the men and the women like the Alma Tadema Roman crowd. So we would have these beautiful pale lemon, sherbet pink, pistachio, dove blue tunics made and we would have these long sausages in corresponding colors that we would wrap around the breast and twist around hang it down wrap it around the hips pull it round, and hang it down to the ground the only problem was <laughs> this was lovely in one's mind and it was lovely when they were made and they were on the hanger but when you get to malta everybody's four foot six and that's why <laughs> Is this going out in water? <laughs> That's going out, you know, it's going everywhere. If anybody downloads it. <laughs> no, it was, I mean, I just think about, I mean, even, even, I mean, Derek Jacoby is in, is in Gladiator. And I, when I was growing up, still to this day, one of my favorite things I've ever seen on television was the BBC production of I, Claudius from the 70s. And, and to see, I'll watch anything that Derek Jacoby's in. But, you know, you had the Roman Senate. You had to deal with those clothes. You had to deal with the royalty or the, the obviously the, the Caesars. And it, it, it just looked like such a daunting task on that film. Did it ever, was it ever overwhelming for you? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was. And um, basically, I had the best cutter in the world who did um, Connie and... I've had people say to me recently how glorious she looked. Oh. I really think it was because she took a real slant to the Roman um, feel or the, you know, she took a Roman feel and then ran with it. So I give her complete credit for that. Annie Hadley, again, RIP, sadly. Um, the, basically, Russell was possibly the easiest once we got the armors down but he had 12 different cuirasses i think no he had eight different cuirasses you know from when he was a slave um and then he starts to fight and then he gets the black cuirass and he adds to it every fight he does he adds another he puts his um, money into silver carving for the front of it um you know that he was more straightforward than a lot of the rest of them which hmm. took a lot of thought but what we had to do was we had to make 12 of everything you know because of repeats and stunts and stunts clean and stunts bloody and stunts etc you know because he's a very good rider so we didn't have to have a riding stunt for him but yeah you know it was on on a film like that you obviously have a very diverse group of actors you know with very storied pasts how do you like to work with actors do you do you begin sort of with the script or do you wait till you've met the actor to sort of refine the designs well it really i mean i ridley always gives me a brief let's say for ridley scott and um then we run with it and we usually have the first fitting before we you know, have a meet up with Ridley. Sometimes if it's a a real principle, like with Matt and Adam on uh, The Last Duel, we did it actually in Ridley's office in LA. So he would wander in, they'd discuss the script, they'd chat, and he'd just be sitting there watching what I was, what we'd, tem you know, we'd made pro tem for them. Um, and, uh, he'd make his own suggestions he's very hands-on really very hands-on but basically i like to 
work with the actor and if the actor isn't happy i don't want to use that costume anymore mm. i want a you know a happy actor gives a happy performance end of you know and that's i want the actors to be happy in so collaborative yes absolutely um that film i, I remember hearing the story of how to get really involved, one of the producers showed him a painting, an actual painting of a period piece and said, this is what, because he was like, I don't want to do a sword and sandal movie and pointed to a painting. And a lot of costume designers I've interviewed have talked about how art, they're frequent uh, visitors to museums and that art has a lot of, whether you're talking about 13, 14, 15, 16th century, century paintings, that colors and fabrics are something because that's the only records we have of times is that kind of artwork. Are you a fan of art and do you find yourself frequenting museums for ideas and colors and things like that? All the time, all the time. I mean, we were in the British Museum a lot. I just wandered around Rome, but we're talking about gladiators still. And you know, you just got, you get the most extraordinary, um, just from Trajan's column, I was able to see what the Roman legionaries wore. I was, you know, we did a lot of stretching out their tunics so they weren't quite just um, just to above the knees, so they looked more like a Scottish kilt, for example, etc. And just to give them a bit more dignity. But you know, you wander around Rome. You, there are a hundred museums in Rome that you can go and just spend days in and soak it up libraries and art galleries hugely as well huge Dulwich picture gallery is a huge because I'm South London um, is a huge inspiration to me wonderful wonderful um, portraits there but anywhere books huge amount of books I have now a big collection of art books you can always find something and Ridley is passionate about Bruegel I'm passionate about George de la Tour and obviously Alma Tadema when we were doing Gladiator. But he's a painter himself. He was seven years at art college, three mm -hmm. years at the Slade and four years at the Royal College of Art. He's a real painter. So, you know, he'll come out with a painter I've not never heard of and we'll just use it as our Bible. Hmm. Well, after Gladiator, you jumped on, you reteamed with your director from Quest for Fire, but you went and did another. I mean, Enemy at the Gates was a massive, complex film that, you know, on location and all kinds of. <laughs> couldn't have been, again, not a cushy experience, not a lot of posh. <laughs> what was it like going back to. <laughs> not a lot of posh, that's for sure. Yeah. But um, my dear collaborator and colleague, David Crossman was in charge of all the military because he is a military genius. And so consequently, um, I would sort of flit in and flit out and do Rachel Weiss or do Jude or, you know, do Ed Harris. So I, I had the really creamy end of that bargain. Um, and we were based nearly all the time in Potsdam. They had this enormous, I think it was in East German military base. It was, I don't know, something like 15 miles square or something like that. So they had every location more or less apart from the water that they needed there. And uh, they built all the sets there, etc. And then after that, I went on to Hannibal. Uh, with, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm a huge, Hannibal's an incredibly gorgeous movie. And again, Gary Oldman's performance is just stunning. And but the clothes, because you're in Florence, you know, and and the I mean, that movie that movie just looks delicious, <laughs> especially if you're Hannibal Lecter. But um, <laughs> very funny. I mean that that um, the the clothes. I mean, especially especially Anthony Hopkins' wardrobe in the film. When you were working on something which is obviously a follow-up to Silence of the Lambs, but yet it really has its own, it's its own film. Did you, when you're looking back and you're dressing an actor, you know, who originated a character like in Silence of the Lambs, 
Does that influence you when you're working on something like a sequel, or how did you approach that? Because Hannibal feels very unique and very different than Silence of the Lambs, which is what I... It's much more operatic, and the locations are gorgeous. So how do you approach something like Hannibal? Basically, um, obviously, Sir Ant was um, incarcerated for most of Silence of the Lambs. So, you know, I was I had a free reign completely. And getting Anthony into a Prada suit was the best joy I'd ever had. <laughs> he always, he funny enough, would always wear Prada footwear because they were very comfy. But, you know, he's not a Prada wearer. And uh, we got some, I mean, from Agnes B to Armani. And he was happy in everything. He was, the, he's the dearest man in the world. But he was just happy to wear anything. The, um, the coat that he walks along the Arno in is um, Yoji Yamamoto. And I think it was probably a Borsellino that he was, no, I don't think it was because it was a broader brim, but it might have been. Um, you know, he was just up for anything. We did keep Julianne very much in the Clarice mode. Yes. You know, it was, um, there was no point because I'd got a lot of designer stuff out and both she and Ridley um, said, I don't think so. I think we just keep to really, you know, she was an FBI grunt, if you want, you know, a little bit more elevated, but she wouldn't have had the money for that, um, that elevation, should I say. So that was, you know, you just go down one road and then you veer off to another. But it was great, you know, Ray Liotta, it was wonderful, the whole, uh, the whole cast in that. Giancarlo Giannini, brilliant. Oh, so good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, but another movie I got to talk to you about because another movie that I dearly love that you worked on that I feel does not get the love it deserves is Michael Mann's Miami Vice. Oh. <laughs> another, an, like you don't choose these easy movies to work on, you know. Um <laughs> Uh, look, man, I gotta say though, come on, Jamie Foxx and Colin Farrell, the the glorious, the, glorious gorgeous boys. I loved them so much. They were so so. With the great. linen suits, I mean, it was everybody in that movie. Everything about again another man, another director, and Michael Mann, who is a a taskmaster and obviously probably very particular in a different way than maybe Ridley Scott was. But when you got on that movie. I mean, it shot for a long time. It was all over the place. But still, man, your clothes, the costumes in that film. I've always been curious. You know, Miami Vice, you're you're following up one of the most iconic TV shows of the 80s. <laughs> where loafers with no socks and linens and peaches and all this. Now, when you were when you were brought on board, had you been a Miami Vice fan? Because again, the movie has such a distinct it isn't a copy of the show at all. And and it is one of the most cool, ultra cool movies. It's so cool. And what was it like working on that? Where did you approach that? Because that's so different from what you've been doing. It was, well, no, because, you know, I have done contemporary quite a bit. Um, but basically it was um, such a hard act to follow. It really was. And with... Um, Basically, we had to give Michael so much choice. We would walk to his office with these huge, great um, boards of photos. That, you know, I think I probably did 50 hours of fittings for both of them you wow. know, with various looks here and there. And, you know, it was all the other characters as well. So luckily, very unluckily, I have to say, Colin put out three ribs, pop three ribs. So we basically, we were prepping for ever, it seemed, because he had to recover. He went off for six weeks, eight weeks, I think, maybe to recover, which um, just did buy us a little bit more time, I have to say. But it was, we were doing a lot of night shoots. We were on the um, tanker for a very long time. And uh, it was getting a brief, getting Michael to give me a brief 
on you know the following day i'd have to leave him notes and i'd wait till midnight and i'd go i have to go i've got to get up at eight you know no six probably to start work at eight it was um it was quite an experience i think i was there for nine months in miami, miami and, uh, prepping on it but then uh came back and I think we did Body of Lies after that. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah, you did, you did American Gangster and Body of Lies. Mm. Um, and then went into space. Yeah, that's my next question. But I wanted to ask you on Miami Vice, you know, Michael Mann was shooting digitally. Um, was that ever, did you have to change up, I'm just curious from a like a color or fabric standpoint, the way that HD or, or, or video works? Do you have to change the what you do or not at all? No, I've never. A lot of costume designers have been very affected by the change from film to um, HD. And frankly, it's never really bothered me hugely because mm. I feel, you know, you can't break things down to the point where it looks operatic. It is what it is. And yes, I would prefer if you know, there were certain little things that didn't quite show up so much. But on the other hand, you can press a button and it goes gray. You know, I think that's a miracle. It's, I prefer the DOP not to do it, but you know, it is quite extraordinary. I prefer the choice and Ridley on um, Prometheus. Yes, it was Prometheus. We all went to see the rushes and they had rushes of 35 mil, rushes of HD, and rushes of just video. And there was no question, absolutely no question. And he is a painter, as I've said, he was so absolutely fanatical about 35 mil, but it just basically sealed the deal. So, you know, all of this um, roll rocket or whatever they called the, the specific camera that they had on Miami Vice you know it paid off it really paid off well now you mentioned since you mentioned going into space I, I mean Ridley Scott obviously did Alien that came out in 79 that has in my mind the most iconic maybe 2001 and Alien have the most iconic space suits ever put on film 2001 being very sleek but Alien sort of biomechanic H.R. Giger kind of a thing but the spacesuits in uh, Prometheus and The Martian are some of the coolest space outfits I mean not just the suits themselves but the actual astronaut crew especially I mean Prometheus with the helmets and the looks and Obviously, this was something new. What was it like when Ridley Scott dragged you into the darkest reaches of outer space? Did you have to change things up? Was it just a matter of doing research? What what was that like for you? No, yeah, it was absolutely terrifying, like every movie <laughs> I have ever done. Just terrifying. And I found a concept artist who used to design car interiors and car engine pockets wow and he designed my helmets and my belts and he is a dear friend now and he's done all of them he did the martian he did alien covenant and i mean i can just absolutely turn to him for something that is streamlined and beautiful i'd love to take the credit but um you know i can't really it but you found him it was your, yeah. yes, it's you found him. <laughs> I found him. I employed him. But he's a genius. He really is. And he doesn't, well, he does do this quite a lot now. I think he's found his niche, but uh, he hadn't done a lot of it. And so basically, we it was trial and error with Ridley. You know, you have to make them. We made so many globes of different <laughs> egg shapes of that sort of egg this sort of egg, that sort of slightly alien type egg. You know, we. I remember taking all these globes to him. He was directing something on set and just laying them out. And he went, no, no, that one, you know, and then we'd build around it. And actually Prometheus was 
that helmet was the most difficult because it had 11 working monitors in it. It had, obviously, it was wired for sound, but sound to record because they spoke. It had something like a thousand, 1200 LED lights because they were lit alone on the planet, you know, by their helmet. And obviously they had the breathing mechanism because the whole globe would just frost up otherwise with condensation. Mm -hmm. They also had to breathe. So we did quite a bit and none of it was CGI at all because it was still it was 2008 or nine, but it was, you know, still quite early for CGI. For that film, they had, um, they had, I, I watched, there's a, a friend of mine made a great documentary on the making of that movie. It's like four and a half hours long, but they had that room that was just covered in art, pre-production art. I don't know if you ever saw that room that they had. It was kind of a wood, kind of a funky, really cool room. When you, when you come onto a movie like that, that's had a lot of extensive development and you're presented with art that has been done do you feel do you still have a freedom to to work yeah. when absolutely i just tell them to mind their own business and they can <laughs> you know, just so that's concept art you're talking yes about, of course right? absolutely concept art they would put their own vision of a spacesuit in you know i i think that that's fine we were just we were carrying on under ridley's guidance we would you know trial and error again with the suits, with the fabrics, with the everything. It's like everybody now is making superhero suits. They're, they're still having huge problems with the fabrics and with the, you know, the stretches and the strains and you can't do that because you've got a shoulder there and all of that, you know, it just, <laughs> it's endless. And concept artists do not understand the human figure at all. So I just, hello. <laughs> Another movie I, that you worked on that I've got to give a shout out to because I love it is The Counselor. Uh, I love it too. <laughs> I, I, the movie, it's so good. I, I mean, I don't really have any questions about The Counselor, but it's great. <laughs> I just want to say it. Well, I have to say it was, I was so emotional because this guy has written every book I have queued up to buy. Cormac I McCarthy. I, yes, I love all his writing. It was superb. And the fact that he'd written this script alone for Ridley, it was just such an honor. It was only really when the film came out, I went, what's this about? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it and I loved everyone in it. And it was oh. terrific to shoot. Well, the but costumes like, are, uh, you know, you really had a hand. I, I had to ask, I guess I, my question about that is, I mean, everybody sort of were defined part of the way you understood who these characters were by how they're dressed. And like, you know, Brad Pitt's wearing a cowboy hat and stuff. Was that was that in the script or did the actors, I mean, between the hairstyles and the costumes, were you able to go a little off page or come up with stuff that's a little more outlandish than maybe was there? Um, basically, Ridley said he is a very well-to-do cowboy. And I know that look, you know, it's, you can buy it in any shop, you can have it tailored and there's wonderful yokes in suede and, you know, those lovely backs with the belts and he was a joy. We, we made all of his, um, Javier oh. was dressed out of the, out of the Versace cupboard. I mean, he just went in, we went in one day and had so much fun. <laughs> the whole day just roaring with laughter because he was so much that character the minute he put on those crazy colors um i'm not quite sure i think between javier and ridley they decided on the hairdo or the hair don't you might call it <laughs> and um cameron was glorious because uh we used a english designer who's um lives in LA and works out of LA and she opened her she opened all her archives to us so because Cameron had something like 25 changes or something like that yeah. and um you know we just went from there really it was uh, it was quite quite a ride it was great fun and you know the the I have to mention that the um 
the version that was released on home video is like 25 minutes longer than the theatrical cut and it's very much worth getting <laughs> it's it's well, it, Thank you. it's it's yeah, very it's it's just it's great it's great so then after that i mean obviously the stuff you had done with really period period pieces and everything and stuff like all the money in the world which had a very hannibal feel in terms of of its look and all that um which i re- i mean i really the look of it was it was great i love that because it's kind of in the same your his you've got historical epics that really was doing and then you've got sort of the modern it was modern but you know not it's it's still period but it has a that it, there's a Ridley Scott look that you and him have developed in terms of costumes that I think is really unique to your collaboration no other movies look from a costume design standpoint look like what you've done with Ridley Scott over the last past decades you you really created and I would say it's a look that's unique I don't know if anyone else could design it it's I mean it's really unique to what you've done which I think is really part of the joys of watching Ridley Scott movies now is is that collaboration watching people the actors walk around in whatever they're wearing gives the film such gravitas if that makes any sense well that's very flattering thank you so much I was totally unaware of it it's it no it's absolutely there I mean I'm a huge as you could tell a huge fan of, of Ridley Scott's and the work you you both have done together but it, it very much is a you know, you go back and you look at something like American Gangster, and the clothes in American Gangster are are incredible, but they have a they have that Ridley Scott Janty Yates feel to them. You know, if somebody if, I'm very flattered by that nomenclature. Well, I think it's it's but it's true. So now we come to obviously both Last Duel, another again a a, a Ridley Scott undeniable period piece, and then you go to House of Gucci, which, again, maybe the ultimate collaboration in terms of, because you've got your historical Ridley and then you've got your modern Ridley with the two of you. And House of Gucci, first of all, I got to ask, you're making a movie, you're a costume designer making a movie about a, a fashion house, an icon. Was that terrifying? No, every film is terrifying. Um, I had actually known about the Gucci script for several years because it was brought to Ridley by his wife, Janina Faccio, now Lady Scott. And um, so it had been around and it had even gone out to Wong Kar Wai. <gasps> and it had gone to- I Another know, one of my favorite directors. <laughs> well, yes, beautiful. Who loves his clothes. <laughs> yes. And it went to Jordan Scott, Ridley's daughter, for a while. It just went around. And I'd just be there going, don't forget about me. You know, just <laughs> Janina, bless her. I said, no, I won't, I promise. And so when it happened, it was kind of, this is great. This is <laughs> wonderful. Um, and that you're going to direct it, Ridley. How amazing. You know, it was fantastic. And then they came up with the cast, which was phenomenal. It was really phenomenal. But I'd um, prepped a year earlier because they'd sent me the script a year earlier and I happened to be in Rome. So I went to the Gucci Museum, which I hadn't even known existed, but it was in Florence again. Um, And there was a huge amount to take in there. And I crewed up, but then Matt rang Ridley and said, hey, I've just written this script with Ben, would you direct this film? And that this happened like more or less overnight or, you know, overnight in Hollywood because it was like probably, I don't know, a month or so, but there we were suddenly on The Last Duel. Wow. Uh, uh, which I, I, I liked very much. Uh, I thought yeah, the last... I think, um, I think it didn't get the... I didn't didn't think it got the coverage of cinemas you know um it was cleared off to make room for the eternals that was in like three or four cinemas in a cinema and bond was still churning out you know everyone's favorite so i hopefully people will pick it up on streaming when it comes out yeah i think so i think people well because movies are always so compulsively watchable 
and I think people will will stumble across it and and because uh, I mean it looks incredible the performances are incredible and it's got a really compelling story it's kind of not really a millennial story I don't think I don't think they're interested in well that's a very sweeping statement um, but it's it's quite a meaty story mm. and it's you know it's you've got to get your head around it and it's two and a half hours long you've got to be prepared to watch it to the end because it's brilliant you know especially the ending well with house of gucci i mean first of all the casting of lady gaga uh, the uh, and jared leto I, I mean i mean everybody al pacino jeremy irons i i mean it it is an adam driver the cast of this movie gels and works so well together um and it, it's just it's such a fun movie to watch but lady gaga herself being a fashion icon i mean how many times has she dazzled at the met gala or whatever red carpet she's on when you sat down with her somebody who already has a keen sense of her own fashion status what's it like for you to work with someone like her she seems like she'd be pretty game I saw, I, I went into a screening and watched them speak afterwards. And she said, you know, like she started working on the accent six months before she even started the film. Um, she was very much in character all the way through. That is undeniable. But it was quite frightening because Ridley had said, I want her quite, you know, not severe, but just conservative. And I was going, oh, <laughs> how am I going to broach this to this? you know, the most famous woman in the world um, and known not only for her fabulous voice, but, you know, for her extreme costumes. And uh, she just turned around on the very first Zoom that we did and said, I want to look like my mother. And her mother was 100% Italian. And um, basically, um, sorry, I'm just telling them to shut up next door. Um, basically, <laughs> um, she was absolutely wonderful. She was collaborative to the nth degree. And we had hours and hours of fittings. She would discuss her makeup, her wigs, etc. She would enact the scene. I'd be Maurizio or I'd be Paolo or whatever, <laughs> you know, fumbling my lines. But, you know, she would act that and she would fine tune it down to the last earring, the last ring, the last, you know, the handbag, the everything, which saved time in the long run, really. It was quite unusual because normally you just make sure the dress fits or, you know, we'll put these shoes with it. And then you do all the all the curly bits on the day. But her weight of work, each day she'd have at least two big scenes with a lot of dialogue, sometimes three, and three costume changes as well. So it was much simpler to put the costume in, lay out the jewels, and just stand by. And did you did you use a lot of real Gucci stuff from the period? Well, we were very lucky to be allowed into the Gucci archive, um, which was on the move. So it was in a room. It wasn't in an archive per mm. se. We always imagine a dusty roof, you know, in a yeah. sort of warehouse. But um, no, there were about 16, 18 outfits there. And um, we were able to finally, um, we could ship them to LA and we had one session with her. We had about four or five Zoom fittings with her for three or four hours each time. And one of them was for the Gucci archive. And they all fit her like a glove. It was fantastic. But basically, uh, we only used two of those outfits because my cutter had made a wonderful closet, I think you call it in America. You know, beautiful dresses, impeccable mm. suits, wonderful coats, shirts, trousers, skirts, etc. And um, then we had vintage from the archives of Tirelli, um, Ferrani and Animode in um, Italy. I mean, I walked into Tirelli's archive. It was fantastic. So I was thinking, where am I going to find? Because Patrizia Reggiani didn't really wear Gucci. She wore a lot of Yves Saint Laurent, a lot of Dior, 
a lot of everyone but Coochie sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, she, um, she would come in and she'd just pick, for example, the spot dress, um, which she wears when she sees Paolo. And she said, I'm going to wear this, I think, when I talk to Paolo and tell him he's brilliant and lie through my teeth. And then we'd do the whole scene, you know, and uh, I think heavy eyeliner, etc. So we had a big rail of Dominic Young, my cutter's wonderful costumes. We'd have a rail of these fantastic archive pieces, just like dying and going to heaven when I went into the Torelli archive store. Then I was, there was some archive that I bought. There was the Gucci archive, which was in the strong room um, under lock and key. And um, then LG opened up her archive for me as well, which was some of it was inappropriate, but a lot of it was wonderful. Mm. So we were full uh, for choice. Well, I'm a huge fan of, I mean, Jared Leto, obviously he's a rock and roll star with 30 Seconds to Mars. He's done so many really interesting things in movies. He worked with like David Fincher on Fight Club. He was in a wonderful science fiction movie called Mr. Nobody. But man, he was, uh, when he came on the screen, I kept looking, where is Jared Leto? I mean, the transformation was extraordinary. And obviously he too is a fashion icon in his own right. I mean, you watch him on the red carpet, that guy's, he, he's an incredible uh, fashionista, I guess. What was it like? Because he, you know, he probably he had to wear some kind of bodysuit or fat suit or something. I mean, his he was, um, he was yes, he he went underwent a complete physical and mental transformation in actual fact, and he would be in uh, prosthetics for four, sometimes five hours, and we would just send along. His suits were made by Atalini. Um, they're the most wonderful makers in Naples. They did the um, tailoring for the Great Beauty. Okay. Which was beautifully, beautiful, exquisitely tailored, absolutely, absolutely exquisite. I actually, I own that movie. I have that on Blu-ray. I love that film. Oh, it's wonderful. It really is. And in fact, our masked ball um, was sort of based on that mad first hour of that film that party went on board didn't it it was fantastic i mean we didn't quite go that far but it was kind of fellini-esque i thought oh absolutely all the tailoring for that they make for presidents they make for rulers of small african countries you know they hand stitch everything and they made all of jared leto's what they call dandies a dandy's dandy <laughs> outfits which were hilarious to uh, put together it was great fun and they really work with his performance as well i you know i was curious about the color palette of those his costumes i i really i thought that it all again it worked so well together with his performance did he have any input into the color like you said this is like uh gaga said i want this when i meet Maurizio. but but did did for for Paolo, did Jared Leto say, I want this color here, this color there? Not really, no. I actually had made um, the elephant cord suits um, and we were waiting just for the tailoring to arrive. So I just put him in that for the first outfit and it seemed to have taken off. It seems to have its own Instagram <laughs> page. Well, not quite. That's Adam's sweater. That really <laughs> does have its own Instagram page and its own extraordinary um, website etc it's amazing absolutely amazing what uh, that first photo did to the uh, internet no it, it's an amazing i mean and everybody like when you're working with what one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when pacino is talking to jeremy irons about sort of the disposition of the company and you know two of my favorite actors um i mean i've loved both of them for so long do you ever get like <laughs> when you're working on that, just even that scene, you know, you have these two legendary actors just sitting talking to each other in a beautiful location outdoors. Do you ever do you ever get starstruck as a costume designer? I mean, you're working with these actors, you're seeing them, you know, does it ever do you ever like watch back scenes when you see the movie and go, man, that's cool. Well, 
I was terrified of Al for the first two or three Zooms because I just thought he was going to shout at me. <laughs> you know, I was absolutely waiting for him to talk to me like that. And he's so gentle <laughs> and so sweet and just so enthusiastic about how he looked. And so we became friends. So that was wonderful. Jeremy, I worked with on uh, Kingdom of Heaven. And uh, so we're old friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, I wasn't starstruck. I was just happy that they were working together so well. And we only, Ridley's a great short taker. He'll do two or three and then ask them if they want to do another one. And if they say no, move on. So. No, I wasn't. But I do get starstruck. Good God, yes, of course I do. You know, starstruck at the beginning of this movie, completely. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it it is a it is a. I really enjoyed the film. Uh, I thought it was just a lot of fun to. Watch. I didn't know much about that story too, so it just well, looked like everybody was having a blast making it. This is the whole thing that you know. Really, the whole purpose. Um, although it's slightly skewed now because um, it's been so well received and everybody loves it and it's so humorous, um, mainly LG and um, Jared. But basically it, um, it was to show the world exactly what happened in the Gucci household. You know, I mean, by household, I mean, the really it's more of a castle <laughs> castle <laughs> old and uh, the fact that he was murdered well nobody apart from every man woman child and dog in italy knew about it everyone else in the whole world didn't whereas versace gets gunned down in miami it's global news you know but poor old maurizio just sunk without a trace and so really the primary whole aspect of this film was to bring that news to the world and the fact that you know lg is just the most wonderful performer in it and so is everybody else it's just it's a bonus isn't it really it's amazing well listen as we we wrap up this i could i could keep here for hours <laughs> trying to sift through but i won't um <laughs> You know, going back to your, your very storied career, and I, uh, as again, I'm a huge fan of your work, and I, I think when people look back at collaborations between directors and costume designers, your what you've done with, with Ridley Scott is, 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 is a singular thing. The two of you together have created a singular experience for audiences, certainly. Um, but how, it, it, there's a lot of people now, we've got social media, like you said, a, a suit can become famous on Instagram. There's a lot more people wanting to get into this. How would you suggest, if there were people now watching this interview that are interested in getting into this as a profession, what would you suggest budding costume designers do? What is your advice? Well, basically, because now there is so much work out there that you have people who are reaching stations that they're not qualified for. Mm -hmm. I would say get the best possible grounding in costume, Learned pattern cut. I mean, my pattern cutting is atrocious, <laughs> but at least I know what should be done. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like really bad. Um, but I know, you know, I went through that training. If you if you really care, then you should. I wish I'd gone to um, history of art. I, I wish I'd done that degree, history of art, um, because I've learned so much through the years, through art. And I would have loved to have had that as a basic grounding as well. Breaking down how to dye with twigs and, you know, mushrooms and stuff like that. You just don't learn once you're in the business. You know, all of these things you can just get a grounding on. Even if you get just a grounding in sewing, fabric, textile, feel the feel of how to cut something on the bias how you know drawing just get a grounding in it somehow go to art college do 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 your basic degree and then then you've got something you've got legs i would say well you've got 
you've obviously got kit bag going now. I don't know if you saw this, but on social media last week, Russell Crowe posted a photograph. And he posted a photograph. It was a split screen, and it was of Maximus from Gladiator going basically the are you not entertained photo. And then above him, it was Russell Crowe, who obviously <clears throat> is clearly getting back into Gladiator shape because he looks pretty good, like he had put on some weight. And he's clearly working out and kind of did, did the same pose. So uh, as a Gladiator fan, somebody I could probably recite that movie frontwards, backwards. Uh, I got to ask, I'd be remiss. Gladiator 2? Well, for a start, he died. So well, I think you're barking up the wrong tree there. And so did Commodus. You know, but so Nick Cave, you know, Nick Cave wrote a, a script for Gladiator Two twenty years ago, where the gods of Olympus sent back uh, sent Glad sent Maximus back to Earth. Well, that's a new take. I wonder if Ridley's heard about that. He probably read it and said that's got to be my next one. <laughs> Thank you for everything that you said about Ridley, and I am he is he is my inspiration. It, everything comes from him doesn't come from me i just i'm the facilitator well i mean i think that 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 but you know you have a there's definitely a, a, a sensibility that's flown th flows through all of your work and uh it, it there is a distinct look to it and there's a feel to it and i think that when you're you know the thing about ridley scott's movies is he's such an incredible visual stylist it but it's everything in the frame and if the stuff that's in the frame doesn't work he doesn't get that feel, which obviously he gets with you. So the synergy of the two of you working together creates a feeling for the audience that, you know, not a lot of filmmakers have. Well, that's so nice of you to say. Thank you very much indeed for your. Oh, I'm just, I'm just. This is, a, this is, a, this is a objective viewpoint. I'm just taking it in. <laughs> well, can people? Do you have an Instagram account? Can people follow you on social media? No. Um, and I don't really intend to either. <laughs> if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I have agents. <laughs> but your work, I mean, obviously your work speaks for itself and uh, you have such a, a vast uh, uh, collaborative uh, work that you've done, not just with Ridley Scott, but I mean, even Gillian Anderson. <laughs> you know, like, look at that. I loved that film. I loved it so much. Um, we shot it in medieval France with you know, frost on every gnarly old tree and Kate was just so glorious in it. Um, it was, again, a shame it didn't do better, but it's always there. It's on DVD. It's probably on download. Of course you can download it. So Charlotte Grey is what it's called. Yes. To all your listeners out there. Another, another, another period piece. You know, it seems like you got, you were doing, you went from what you can kind of chart. There's sort of an interesting, interesting things, how you go from one to another. So, uh, I, I love well, that. You know, you know what happened? I failed my history O level twice. <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't know, because they were just concentrating on the second world war. And, uh, I have been through every period more or less now. <laughs> in uh, in my life thanks to film and uh, also i gave up geography for music and i've been to nearly every country i've wanted to go to <laughs> film. so thank you film for that kindness and openness it was wonderful such an experience well janty Yates, this has been a phenomenal conversation thank you so much for giving us uh, your time and your insight to the designing hollywood podcast what a wonderful guest you've been and I cannot thank you enough. Uh, your latest work, House of Gucci, is in theaters now. You are currently prepping Kit Bag, which is a, a, another Ridley Scott production about Napoleon. So, and while you can't comment on Russell Crowe, I don't know why he's working out, but hey, Gladiator 2, Electric Boogaloo, I'm coming. I can't wait. I'll be first in line. Well, I'll be first in line for whatever you do. I love you for that. Thank you so very, very much indeed. It's so nice to talk to you. Well, thanks for being here. Special thanks to our sponsor for this episode of the Designing Hollywood podcast, the Western Costume Company. The Western Costume Company, 
a one-stop shop for costume designers, customers, and stylists. Since the early days of Hollywood over a century ago, Western Costume has been an industry mainstay. Whether you work in film, television, theater, commercials, or fashion, you'll find what you need in their vast warehouse. A special thank you to the president of Western Costume, Eddie Marks, for all of your support. I want to thank Janty Yates for that incredible interview, and I'm sorry, Janty, if I got a little too geeky. I couldn't help it. I was geeking out. A very special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button, and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts, also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.